tonight we're going to have lovely speaker Erin speak about sensuality. Yes. And um, yeah, I'll let you say the rest. Um, so my name is Erin Jordan and I'm a writing teacher. Um, I got my MFA in creative writing at San Francisco State. And that was quite a while ago, that was about five years ago. And since then I've been teaching writing workshops um, mostly on the east side, like Silver Lake, um, Echo Park for the last couple of years. Um, most of it is writing from personal experience. Tonight I'm going to be speaking about uh, sensuality, which has a lot to do with the five senses. And we all know what the five senses are. Um, it's do we? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody? Right. Throw one out. Senses. Sight. Sight. Smell. Smell. Touch. Taste. 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 Hearing. Hearing. I see dead people. All of them. And then sometimes people say there's a sixth sense, which would be intuition. There is eight senses, I believe. <laughs> well, that, that'll be next time. Um, so basically, we're going to be working with our sense of smell tonight. And also, um, I wanted to kind of discuss the fact that the way that we know everything about the world is through these five senses. It is the bridge by which we understand our entire environment. And I think we're living in a culture and a place where things are very sped up. Um, things are very um, computer-based, which means there's a bunch of senses we're not using when we're on a computer all day long. Um, we're very isolated. And we're also sometimes overstimulated in some ways, meaning overstimulated usually in terms of images or in terms of clicking or in terms of words. But like the full sensory experience isn't being used in our daily lives. So I have some ideas about that too. And every class that I start out, um, I read a quote from this woman named Diane Ackerman, and she wrote a book called A Natural History of the Senses. And it is a fantastic book that goes through all five senses and kind of describes it not only using um, science, but also using nature, using physiology, using um, how our minds work. And um, it's a really great book if anybody's interested in it. But to, uh, Natural History of the Senses. And it's by Diane Ackerman. And by the way, if you'd like to like drop me an email or something, I can give you all this information. I can even send you my notes. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm pretty generous. Um, so what she wrote was, and this is what I actually want on my headstone. So this is like a really important <laughs> wow. word to me. This is like very, very big. Okay, when you consider something like death, after which there being no news to the contrary, we may well go out like a candle flame, then it probably doesn't matter if we try too hard, are awkward sometimes, care for one another too deeply, are excessively curious about nature, are too open to experience, enjoy a nonstop expense of the senses in an effort to know life intimately and lovingly, it probably doesn't matter if while trying to be modest and eager watchers of life's many spectacles, we sometimes look clumsy or get dirty or reveal or ignorance or say the wrong thing or light up with wonder like the children we all are. So in many ways, dealing with the senses is getting back to your body, getting back to your innocence in some ways, and getting back to kind of, it's the basics. It's the right. five basics, right. you know? And I think sometimes we've been told to, you know, sit there and not say anything and not feel anything and not be like, oh, that's interesting texture to Giselle. Like, how did you choose that? Or like, you know, I don't know what kind of aftershave you're wearing, but that's really interesting to me. We just don't make these kind of sensory, personal connections mm -hmm. with people anymore because it's considered rude, right? Or it's considered um, talking about something awkward or... So we lose a sense of intimacy because of that, right? We lose a sense of intimacy, right. but we lose a yeah. sense of intimacy with ourselves. Sometimes right? it's illegal. Sometimes it is illegal. <laughs> okay, so what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about the senses. And basically, so through these five senses is the way that we know the world. And um, the way that we know the world is through our senses. The information comes in. It goes to our mind. And that is the way we understand. It's, it's the bridge between us and the outside world. And when you think about sensuality, it's basically savoring um, and being present with what is happening. Um, sensuality is using those five things and focusing on them so that you're not just completely in your mind, not in your body, or you're just completely going through rote reactions and you're not noticing anything. I really recommend, like if you've ever done, take a five minute walk tomorrow, just five minutes, 
I really go slow and look at everything. Like there's the most amazing fern outside your house and it's like a fiddlehead fern right. and it's just starting to bloom. Or like, for instance, I saw these flowers and they, they start as a pod and I was just like, I was, I was just touching the pots and I was like, okay, something's going to happen here. I don't know when it's going to happen, but those are the kind of really beautiful things that you can pick up on in just a very short period of time of giving yourself that time. Um, so basically, sensuality is the outside wor world, five senses are the bridge. Inside of you, how you interpret that is yourself and your consciousness. You decide whether that's pleasurable or painful, right? And out of that pleasure and pain comes the sense of the erotic, right? And the sensual in, in the more sexual sense. And basically what a woman said, um, Esther Perel, is that the erotic line is not very politically correct, right? So sometimes what comes in gets a little, we, we can't homogenize how we interpret things. Like you all have the right to be the children that you all are and light up like the children you all are. And also the erotic is sexuality transformed by the human imagination. So the senses come in, the bridge is through your five senses, your body, it goes inside, your consciousness meets your imagination, and that is where things become truly sensual or erotic or not erotic or painful, and that is, that is the human experience right there. And how you respond to that, who knows? Maybe, maybe you touch somebody and you go, okay. Or you know, maybe there's so many responses that you can have based on that, and I think the minute you start to slow down each of those components is the moment that you really kind of truly become aware and savor the sensuality of the human experience. Um, I also wrote a little bit about what, what kills sensuality. Um, I read a book that's really interesting and it's called, um, it was called Desire. I have the exact title here somewhere. Um, but it's by this guy named Eric Epstein. And the killer of, sensual, of the sensual is a lack of space. Hmm. When you don't have enough space, if somebody's all over you, you want them off you. <laughs> there is a difference between, the only what creates sensual reality is that there has to be a space between you and the other, and you cannot have the other. That is desire. The minute you have the other, whether it is the cookie, if you have a million of those cookies, you're not going to want the cookies anymore. If somebody who you really thought was handsome or attractive is suddenly in your lap, you're going to be like, whoa, too much, right? <laughs> too, too much experience. So that's what desire is. It's the interplay between um, that space between you and another thing, right? So it can be mental, physical, or emotional, but you have to give your body and mind space. And I've seen, especially in relationships between people as they've been together for a long time, sometimes they don't give each other that space anymore. And I think that that's the beginning of the death of that kind of romance or sensual aspect between two people, is that um, if you decide you already know what somebody thinks, or if you decide that um, you're going to make a decision for them, that space becomes erased or eroded, and the pleasure is gone. You know, the pleasure starts to leave you. I think that through meditation, yoga, and like a slow life movement, um, that we can kind of start to get back into our actual sensual input and for taste, smell, and touch. And it's just about slowing everything down. And I would kind of wonder what it would be like if, for instance, tomorrow everybody has a slow hour. I mean, it's the same hour when you think about it. 60 minutes. Right. It's not as if it's the, but just try to have a slow hour, whether it has to do with um, doing something with your hands, doing something with your taste buds, perhaps per perfecting a recipe for a whole hour, you know, perhaps listening to the same thing over and over again, looking for new nuances in that music, looking at the same image for an hour, and looking for something new in it that you hadn't seen before. So that would be my challenge to everyone here, is to kind of bring this back into your life and see if, um, if it's useful, if it makes you feel good. It's supposed to make you feel good. Look at something that makes you feel good. Like, don't focus on images of, like, the Holocaust for an hour. I mean, you know, I, I, I think it should make you feel reasonably good. But if that's what, the way you need to go, that's fine with me. I am the world's most liberal person ever. Um, so basically, holding on too tight, Anais Nin basically said, and this is the moment that I understood love to kind of a deeper extent, is that anxiety is love's greatest killer. 
It makes others feel as you might when a drowning man holds on to you. You want to save him, but you know he will strangle you with his panic. And I think once you kind of get control of your own sensory awareness, you find, you, you see it in other people just how they are tweaking. And it doesn't mean that they're tweaking on methamphetamines. It means that they are just tweaking on their own planet of whatever input they think is making them happy. And it's not. And the, the slower you get a chance to kind of savor your own experience, you can sometimes, I think we can affect others. Meaning that if I slow down, you guys might start to slow down with me. Mm-hmm. And if I speed up, you know, you guys are right here with me too. But it, it changes all of us in the way that we interact with others and the way that we have, you know, consciousness in groups changes um, based on how fast or how slow, how, how anxious we are. And, and the more that we can pay attention to other people is the more we can make decisions about whether we want them around us. You know, I've met a couple of people recently where I was like, not for me. Maybe in a couple of years. <laughs> maybe in a couple of years you'll come to the point where you are for me, but right now, like, I just can't handle it. And it has nothing, it doesn't mean you're right. good or bad. It just means you're just not for me right now. Maybe in a week, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so we're going to... Maybe in 10 years, Ben. <laughs> maybe never. Maybe never. Maybe never. Okay, so now we're going to go a little bit into scent and memory, and most people um, can detect. And, and by the way, can I can I just go public with this, or would you like me not to? I don't care. Well, so okay, so now. this is the true yeah. amazing thing: is that very rarely oh, will you meet yeah. somebody who does not have a sense of smell. Oh, yeah. And we yeah. actually have somebody here. Um, yeah. Kristen does yeah. not have. Yeah. Yeah. So she can taste certain things. Really she, like blandly, but I just can't smell well at all. She can't smell well at all. And, so she she's, like and her brother, you said your brother is actually a pretty good smeller. My brother is like a crazy smeller. Like so somebody else walks in the house, he's not in the room, he's like, oh, someone's just here. So he picked up your sense of smell too. Yeah, pretty much. He, he stole cool. it. He yeah. stole it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there you go. My friend Effie is like that. She, she never has smelled in her life. It's really? Yeah. Yeah. It's very weird. Yeah, it's just well, you started that. to smell now that you quit yeah. smoking. <laughs> that helps. So if anybody smells badly, it's just an economic problem. No, I don't you should. I'm yeah, next to her. You don't need to stinky. take shower. I, I told her I was wearing my new natural deodorant, and I was like, maybe was like, you and I should stick together for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really quite sure how it's working. Um, I'm keeping my arms like this. Okay, so so basically, smell is the first sense. It's the first sense. It is the one that developed first from our lizard brain. It does not have language. Um, So the way that we discuss sense usually has to do with metaphor. And this is totally intriguing, because talking to Kristen, she's such a great example of somebody who's overcoming and finding different side ways of dealing with sense, is that she said that she'll have somebody describe a day or a feeling or what it's like. Right, right. Like if I don't, like even just, I was giving the example of buying perfume, I obviously can't buy my own. So I'll go with my little brother, who has this crazy sense of smell, and he'll smell it and be like, well, it's like, if you're in the woods and it was kind of warm and it's like a late afternoon, almost dusk, and there's a lot of like bark on the ground, there's a lot of nice. wood, I'm like, okay, now I can get it because I can picture it in my head. Mm-hmm. So I, people, I just ask people to create a scenario. Also, like a, lot, a fun game is my friends are like, smell it, see if I can do it, I never can. Um, but I always tell them, I was like, you tell me what it smells like. And then they'll try to describe it to them, like, pick it like a picture. And then I can know, I can picture, I don't, yeah. I just don't know what it smells like, but I have an idea of what it smells like. Right. Now. Like she smells like herbal tea. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or like, this is floral, and this smells like rosemary. Right, right. Yeah, so now I can picture it. Which means that probably you're, you've built a visual slash mm-hmm. emotional profile that's actually not based on the scent right. itself. Right, right. You're like, this is a warm, cozy tea. Exactly. You know, this has to do with things that are earthy, right. but I, I don't, don't really know what it smells like, but I know how to feel in mm-hmm. that situation. But a lot of times when we eat something, um, taste, we, yeah. we taste it from smell. So right. how, how do you perceive food? So my yeah, smell is like, nice. well, my taste is uh, diminished. So I can still taste it, so I know I still have a little bit of a sense of smell. And if something's like really, really, really awful smelling, I'll taste it in my mouth. I'm like, oh, it tastes like burning. But I can't smell it, I don't know that's where I'm getting it from. Yeah, like smoke, it'll it'll taste like, you know, if you eat like charred barbecue, Uh it tastes like that in my mouth. So I'm like, oh, Uh, I know. bitter. Right, so I'm like, look, I know something smells in here. Now because I can smell it because I can taste it. And so I always describe it to people, like, when I'm smelling, um, like with color, that's how I simulate it. So with color, there's red, blue, and green, but there's a thousand reds and a thousand blues and a thousand greens and everything in between. But for me, I just have red, and I'm blue, and I have green. Which, so I like, like, really strong taste. Which is what I wanted to, that's a great segue, because I have a quote about that. Um, 
So basically, we smell more than we actually consciously can pay attention to, whether it's um, pheromones. I mean, we are animals, basically. And we, whether it's all uh, women ovulating together, whether it's testosterone coming out through the pores, or whether it's the aesthetic choices, like perfume, that we make in order to create an image of scent that we want to portray to other people. Um, there is a guy who basically said, his name's Alan Hirsch, and he's director of the Smell and Taste Treatment and Research Foundation in Chicago. You might want to check him out. Um, that there are, he, says, okay, he says that there are exercises you can do at home to protect and even sharpen your sense of smell. He said that someone who is colorblind can look at red and green all day but never see it. It's like most men, right? But with smell, you can actually cause nerve connections to act and smell what perhaps you couldn't before. So you might be able to train your sense of, of smell. Right, right. And so you have, there's hope, basically. If you want to be, if you want to be a, a major right. smeller, right. Like, there's hope. It's, 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 there's yeah. Still, yeah. You still yeah. have chances yeah. to be able to um, yeah. smell more. So now we're going to go into an exercise. And what I'd like...